Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives or believes in me shall never die. Continue to listen to uh, Marcy Griffith. Be wrong to turn it off now. Yes. 
We're here today to give thanks for the life of a dear sister, uh, Mrs. Olive Lillian Barrett. And we extend our deepest sympathy at this sad time. And, and she, she's missed by the fellowship. Uh, you miss that it, that photograph is just, it does bring tears to your eyes, but it, it, it makes you smile because she just always seemed happy. I'm not saying she could, she could tell me off, and she would, but she was such a bright personality, and we do miss her uh, greatly in the fellowship. Yet at this difficult time, we remember that for, for, for Olive, that as uh, one of the Lords, it's a blessed time, as she is absent from the body, but present with the Lord united with her saviour and we do pray that at this time of loss you might know something of the presence of the lord shall we just pray now before we sing our first hymn almighty god we thank you for those that you bring into our lives we thank you for those dear god who have made us who we are in some sense we know that ultimately you are the giver of life but we thank you for our parents, particularly those of us who have known parents that are loving parents. And we do thank you. We don't forget Melbourne and, uh, and, and Olive. They were, they were, for me, I know, they were amazing to go and visit. The house was always open and there was always a, a friendly welcome. And even though in times past, this country wasn't as it ought to have been. And, we thank you that there was no bitterness in our heart and we thank you for and we pray lord for for the family we don't need to pray for olive anymore but lord we do pray for the family and we do pray that they might know something of the presence of the lord jesus christ and we pray that you'd bless and encourage us now as we pay a hopefully a fitting tribute to our dear sister we ask these things in the name of the lord jesus who can do more than we ask or think in his name. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn, and it's the Lord's my shepherd, and we'll stand uh, to sing.
going to ask uh, sister, uh, daughter-in-law, sister, daughter-in-law Jenny to come and read. And then after that, uh, Mel's going to share and Theo's going to share from Colin. This reading is taken from the New Testament, Letter to the Hebrews. It has been chosen to reflect Olive's lifelong, deeply held faith and her assurance that when her time came, she would reside eternal with her God. This is Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, starting at verse 18. The mountain of fear and the mountain of joy. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mother Olive was born on the 16th of April, 1929, to Aubrey and Rhoda Wilson in Clarendon, Jamaica. She was one of two twin sisters, Olive and my auntie Lena, together with her older sister Pearl and her brothers Sonny, Sam and Aubrey. I don't know much about her childhood but she spoke with fondness about her father, Aubrey, who had fought in the Great War, and her mother, Rhoda, who came to live with us in Coventry some years later, for a number of years when I was a child, before returning to Jamaica. In 1955, she had a son, Clive. However, circumstances were such that she could not make a life with his father. And in 1957, she traveled to England by ship arriving in Southampton, before settling in Coventry. My mother was part of what we now regard as the Windrush generation, who travelled from the Caribbean to the mother country to help rebuild the country after the Second World War. It is now very much understood that the welcome my mum and her generation received was not always warm but her generation knuckled down to the task, and my mother worked at the GC factory for many years. In 1959, my mother married my father, had my elder brother Michael, and I arrived five years later in 1964. My parents began by renting a room in a friend's house from back home, and when they eventually bought 27 Beresford Avenue, their first and only home they too rented out a room to a succession of friends from back home. I remember Chinaman and Lloyd, to name but two, to help them make their start in this country and to help pay the bills. Mum provided unconditional love, had a warm demeanour to those whom she met, and was supportive and ambitious for her children. When I was very young, my memory is of being looked after by a collection of aunties until mum had finished work at GC and could collect me. 
It was one of those aunties who first called me Nibs over 50 years ago, and the nickname has stuck ever since. In those early days, she took care to ensure that I was prepared for school and that my school clothes and satchel were in good condition. I also came to understand that she ensured that she sent money back home consistently to provide for Clive and his education. And he was raised by her mother, Rhoda, Clive's grandmother. Long haul air travel was very expensive in the 1970s for ordinary working people. And my mother was thrilled in 1973, having saved up the necessary funds when she was able to return to Jamaica for the first time since 1957, taking my brother Michael and I with her to meet up with Clive and many of her relatives that she had not seen for such a long time. She was to return a number of times to Jamaica following that. Clearly, over time, I've had to reconcile myself to her passing, and there are memories that keep flooding back. One such memory was when I was about eight years old, and she'd taken me shopping with her down Fosal Road. She was buying some food and other provisions at the co-op store, and the shop assistant was ringing up the items on the till. And as a young boy of eight, I came up with the answer for the total bill before the mechanical cash, cash register had worked it out. And the shop assistant was amazed at this. And my mum beamed that her, and said that her son was very bright. Another example of mum's positive disposition was that if she saw a black person with a nice car, she'd always say to me, good luck to them, because you know that they will have worked hard for it and that they should enjoy it. I very much took this to heart, and although she didn't drive herself, later in life, whenever I visited uh, her and dad, she was always happy to jump in and take a ride in a variety of new motors that I turned up in over the years. Like many of their generation, uh, my parents had their five-year plan with thoughts of returning back to Jamaica. However, the five-year plan got renewed every five years. And they remained in this country and very much became part of the fabric of the community in which they lived. Mum was married to my father for over 60 years and they provided a stable and settled upbringing for my brother and I. They were absolutely thrilled to receive a card from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the occasion of their 60th wedding anniversary a few years ago and my thanks to my wife Jennifer, who liaised with Buckingham Palace to organise this for them. My mother lived a long life, and many will have fond memories of her. Achieving the great age of 94 has meant that a great many of her friends had gone before her. It was also clear that she missed her husband Melbourne greatly after he passed in January 2021. As we gather to celebrate her life, it is of great comfort to know that she has been reunited with the love of her life and a great many of her friends. Theo Barrett, one of Olive's grandchildren. I am reading this tribute to Olive Lillian Barrett, Nee Wilson, from Clive Delroy Heslop, her son. The year 1957 was perhaps not such a good year in the household of Aubrey and Rhoda Wilson in the district of Turner's Four Paths in the hills of northern Clarendon. A tinge of sadness might have hovered over the household as Olive Wilson, their beloved daughter, was about to embark on a journey to England, which as it turned would change the trajectory of her life for the better. The feeling of melancholy was further deepened by the reality that one would be leaving behind a young baby boy by the name of Clive, who at the time had no inkling as to what was about to take place as he was about a year and a half. 
Just imagine the feelings welling up inside her as she contemplated a life away from her young baby. Mass Aubrey, as her father was affectionately called, being, being himself a veteran of the First World War, obviously passed on through his DNA qualities of courage and intestinal fortitude, which enabled Olive to step out into the unknown. So began the story of my mother's journey to England, a place where her bigger brother Sam had gone before, and who would now take on the role of facilitating her adjustment. The significance of the 75th anniversary of the Windrush generation is not lost on persons such as Olive. As for her, Windrush provided an opportunity to escape from a place where her life chance would be limited to a place where manpower was needed to build back Britain after the ravages of the war. Having made it safely across, life began to settle into particular routines where fellow immigrants began to circulate. And as history will recall, Olive met a handsome chap from Westmoreland, whom she would marry and remain married to for over 60 years until he predeceased her in 2021. While all these nice things were happening, Clive was back in Jamaica, enjoying the life of a typical rural boy, enjoying the outdoors, riding the donkey several miles to fetch water, playing cricket with his coconut bow bat, taking care of the rabbits, learning to shoot birds with a slingshot. So consumed with I with, act with activities that there was no time to miss mother. Stories of mother told to me by my grandparents meant very little, as in my mind, my grandparents were my real parents. As time passed and I became more aware of the realities of life, a real connection emerged between mother and myself. It came in the form of parcels at Christmas time. This was a big event in the household, as after the notification, our donkey would be padded up for the three mile journey to the post office. On returning home, the contents would reveal all the niceties of England, which brought great satisfaction to all the recipients. So ahead of its time, the various items of clothing were that they gave rise to friends teasing me and attaching names to me on account of the exquisite nature of the apparel. And so if I had doubts before of the real existence of a benefactor mother in England, I now had cause to make the connection. This notion was further cemented in my mind when it, became to, when it became time to go on to high school. Free places and full scholarships were limited to one or two per primary school, and as would be expected, the children of the headmaster would get those. Thankfully, I got a half scholarship, which required the payment of fees. Where would these fees come from over a period of five years? Grandmother anxiously wrote off to mother in England, and like clockwork, the fees arrived and off Clive went to high school. It later became apparent to me that mom had a giant of a man standing behind her, which enabled all of these miracles to occur. Well, Melbourne alive today, I would have to say big up, as his support was unrelenting. Not wanting to disappoint my many backers, I stayed close to my home sweet home, lamps burning the midnight oil, and after five years, much to the delight of all, especially my dear mother, I had passed enough subjects for Barclays Bank to offer me a job, which changed the trajectory of my life forever. The great reveal was to take place sometime in 1973, when mom decided that it was time to see her firstborn, and also for the entire family in Jamaica to meet my two brothers, Mike and Nibs, and to hear stories from her of life in England. At that time, our airport had a waving gallery, which allowed me to take up a vantage point in a desperate attempt to catch a first physical glance of Mom. Eventually, there she was, in her pulchritudinous splendour, with the boys by her side anxious to meet me, having no doubt been told many stories of life in Jamaica. After an enjoyable trip, during which time, thanks to my cousin Sydney and his new Toyota Corona Mark II, we traversed all over Jamaica, including trips to the ancestral home of Melbourne in the parish of Westmoreland. Having had a taste of being around my brothers, I was anxious to relive the experience, and as such, in 1980, I headed off on my own to England on vacation from the bank to see for the first time Mom on her own territory at the fabled 27 Beresford Avenue, a place that had come to symbolise so much in my life. My four weeks living under Mums provided a great opportunity for me to bask in the love, care and hospitality of a mother to a son. Mum and I took trips to Skegness, Cardiff, the Ballroom in Birmingham, 
among other places of interest. Mike also got in on the act when he discovered my love for cricket, and off he went in Sonia's little Simca motor car to Old Trafford. I also recall Mike and I lining up outside Lord's Cricket Ground to see a famous test match. Nibs also got in on the act of one visit and picked me on his team to experience a game. Mum, of course, remained at home and prepared sumptuous meals to delight us on our return. As time passed, Mum got to meet my wife, Winsome, to whom I'd been married for 39 years, and my own children, Christopher, Matthew, David, Tanik, and Danielle. In 2017, Winsome and I made what would turn out to be our last visit to see Mum. It was like so many other visits. We chatted about old times and inquired about the grandchildren. We cooked, we ate, we even assisted with some spring cleaning. When it was time to leave, I sensed that my goodbye would be the last. None of what I have managed to achieve today would have been possible if my mother had not made that fateful journey across the seas to England. I owe all that I have and all I have become to her and to Melbourne. May her soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on her. Thank you, what an amazing tribute to her, uh, and indeed a wonderful lady. We're going to sing our next hymn, and it's What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, and we'll stand uh, to sing.
just read from God's Word and then I'll share a few thoughts about our dear sister here in the fellowship and, and then I'll pray before we sing uh, our last hymn. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and trouble, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I first met uh, Olive uh, when I became the pastor here about 10 or 11 years ago. And she used to sit just on the left and near the second window there'd be Olive organising uh, uh, Mrs Lee and uh, Mrs White. I don't know if you remember Mrs White. Uh, Mrs White, she used to supply the church with shoes for some reason and some years she'd, she'd have uh, overripe damsons that she would hand out. But they used to sit there and Mr Das would sit in the front and Olive, she was always, they always had that big smile. And she'd come in even with her aches and pains and difficulties. And Melbourne would drop her off outside saying, you ain't getting me into that church. And she would come in and he'd be back faithfully to pick her up and to take her home. And I remember going to the house and opening that front door and, oh, I fell in love with the smell of, of curry and rice and peas. And she taught me to cook my first curry and showed me how to do rice and peas. And she did send me up the phone road to get some lamb. And uh, I think I should have taken her with me because I think the shopkeeper ripped me off. But uh, anyway, they would often take me in the garden and, and Mr. Barrett would have his uh, seed for his Scots bonnets, uh, the rosemary for the, the curries and for their rice. And she always had this I was just looking at this wire here, just reminded me of her telephone. Anywhere in the house she could take a telephone on this long wire. But she would, one of the things about Olive was this. You'd go to the house, Melbourne was obviously, he was, he was getting older, he'd been to the betting shop, he had his newspaper and he'd go and lie on the couch and he'd say his pleasantries to me and have a, a laugh. and, and and they, oh, he'd always have to make a drink. Olive would send her in to, him to make a drink for me. And she'd sit at the table and she'd sort of put her skirt on her knees like this. And, and she'd just put her hands in and she'd go, Oh, now let me tell me everything about the church. And you know, when you talk to people and they go, there's a Scottish phrase that says they go glake it, means their eyes cloud over. She never clouded over. And she, you'd often hear her going, oh, oh, oh. And she was listening to everything that I had to say. She made you feel important. Not because I was the local pastor, but just because she listened to people. But she would listen to what I had to say after she talked about Clive and, and Michael and Mel and the grandchildren and all that they'd achieved. And she'd often go, as she got a little bit frailer, she'd, she'd go round and talk about all the pictures on, on that back wall. And I phoned up Michael and, and we had a lovely chat. And I was trying to find a word that would, would describe Olive. She, she was... A character, she was big, and a character was big. And she had that lovely, bright smile. But there was one word, and Michael said it, and, and I, I think you'll all, you all have to agree, she was kind. She, she was hurt by things when she first came here, and it wasn't easy, 
and she could have been bitter and she would talk about these things but she was kind that wasn't taken from her and whoever went to her home she was kind and, and when she couldn't look after herself so well I remember going to visit her upstairs in the front room and anybody else would have been moaning but not Olive she got a radio she was happy with that she got her potatoes <laughs> she loved potatoes and she'd be sitting there eating the food and, and she was content visitor in the home she was just bright and smiley and she, she was just lovely and I was saying to, to, to Mel the last time I visited her was the day before she died and she was very poorly and uh, she, she just had something on her lip and I got some nice tissue and just made her more comfortable and even in her illness she just said thank you thank you and it was it just summed her up this kind generous loving lady and and she will indeed i'm sure those who 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 know her those who are a family she will indeed be sadly missed but what a privilege to have known her and for her to have been part of our lives and I'll finish with this. Being a typical white British lad, my first open coffin was some 30 years ago in Wolverhampton, and I, I, I didn't get it. Two years ago, I got it. As Mel lay there, and an olive just, she was in a wheelchair, she was struggling. And she just stroked his hand. And I, as I stood there, I said, Martin, that's what it's about. I saw a tenderness. I saw all those years of marriage and love and affection. And it was one of the most touching moments that I personally have ever known. And, and indeed, as I said, she'll be greatly missed. And shall we just pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for amazing grace. We thank you that we do not have to mourn as others mourn. And, O oh Lord, we know that the Bible talks about absent from the body and present with the Lord. And our prayer is for the family and for the wider family. And, Father, we pray that they would know something of that love and that big-heartedness that Olive knew. Lord, we pray that you would surround our friends and neighbours. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our, our final hymn before we say the Lord's Prayer, and it's Amazing Grace. <laughs>
please be seated. I'll just pray and then if you want to join with me in the Lord's Prayer, it's on the, the order of service, you're very welcome to. Father, we know that we will be commending our sister later on at Lenton's Lane and we know that she's in your hands. And Lord, we pray that you would be with the family. This is what our prayer is for. We commend them unto your presence. That Lord, that they would see the light of life in Jesus Christ. Lord, surround them. Lift them up. Your Bible says that you are the lifter up of our heads. Father, we pray that they would know your presence. And Lord, we, speak, we say the Lord's Prayer together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'm going to ask the undertakers now to come and, and open the coffin if you want to come and, 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 and you, Olive, you're more than welcome. to you, you're very welcome.
turn that off. It's not doing any good there, is it? Turn it off. Uh, just so you're aware, because of the unstableness of the soil, it can only be a, a token gesture of, of backfilling. I do apologise for that. I'll just pray and then we'll commend it to the Lord. The Lord is good to all and compassionate over it, all he's made. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. To this end, Christ died and lived again. And Father, we do commend the family to you. The Lord, we thank you for the life of Olive. We thank you that your word tells us, absent from the body and present with the Lord. We thank you for her faith. And Lord, we thank you for the comfort we have from this. The book of Isaiah said, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. For as much as our sister has departed out of this life, we therefore commit her body to the elements, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, trusting in the infinite mercy of God in Christ Jesus. Our oh, Father, we pray now that your face will shine upon this family and Lord, that they might know the Saviour that Olive knew. Lord, surround them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Just so that you know, that that's it now. But uh, if you want to stay for a bit, you can. But just so that you're aware, aware that you, you're able to leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Hello. Oh, hello. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, no, she was a lovely lady. Mass massively missed, I'm sure. Yeah. So she was at my... No, no problem. She was at my daughter's yeah. birth. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? Leia. Oh, yes, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you.
just that's like oh yeah like, I think I remember now you might have told me that um, yeah that sounds familiar yeah. yeah so yeah I watched it before so And now the grave has been filled in mechanically and most of the family have left. Um, Mella's just left a few minutes ago, as you may have noticed on the live stream.
As long as I live, I shall. 